Okay, good afternoon. I am Andrei Konoplyanik, Dr. Andrei Konoplyanik, Professor Andrei Konoplyanik. I am currently an advisor to Director General of the Gazprom Expert LLC, and I am Professor at the Chair International Oil and Gas Business of the Russian State Gupkin Oil and Gas University. And I am here in Tartu, invited to participate in the Autumn School, and one of my presentations was on the Energy Charter Treaty issues. And uh, that is the topic that I would like to address now in my address to, to you. Energy Charter is a very important part of my life. Uh, in 1990, uh, when Mr. Ruud Lubers, the then Prime Minister of the Netherlands, has first announced the initiative of creating common European energy space that was later well known as the Lubbers Plan and then further was uh, developed into first the European Energy Charter and then uh, into the Energy Charter Treaty. I was working in the State Planning Committee of the USSR. Both the country doesn't exist now and the, this organization doesn't exist now. But since that time I have been dealing with this agenda because my first report, my first review of this proposal I wrote in July 1990. And that's why I have been following this agenda, and uh, I was the head of the Russian delegation at the negotiation on the treaty in my capacity of the then Deputy Minister of Russian Federation in Energy, responsible for foreign direct investments and the foreign uh, economic relations in energy. And afterwards, after I have left the ministry, since 2002 and 2008, uh, after has been winning the international bidding procedure, was appointed as the Deputy Secretary General of the Energy Charter Secretariat in Brussels. So that's why Energy Charter is an important part of my life. And it's not because I was involved in this activity that I like this process and supporting this. It's the other way around. I do see the objective role of the Energy Charter and its instrument in the evolution of the international energy markets development and related to these developments evolution of the international mechanisms of investment protection and simulation. That's why I gladly agreed to present uh, the lecture on these issues here in Tartu earlier today, and that's why I am very much thankful for the opportunity to approach through the broader TV audience on this issue to you, whoever you are. Uh, so now let's come to the substance. You will agree that now we are living in the more and more globalized energy world. That means that here in the Eastern Hemisphere, we are living in more and more cross-border energy world. You know that the major centers of energy consumption here in Eurasia, uh, Western European countries, the countries of the European Union in the West, Russia as a major producer, of course, and the countries in Asia, like China, like Japan, Korea, and South, other countries um, of the uh, uh, Southeastern Asia in the East, those major centers are located on quite a big distance from the major producing centers, which is Russia, Middle East countries, Northern Africa. So that does mean that cross-border issues, cross-border transportation, which is linking the production centers with the consumption centers, is an issue that doesn't exist in the middle of the previous century. So when, for instance, WTO, World Trade Organization, was established as former general agreement on tariffs and trade in 1947, the architecture of the international energy world was quite different. And so there was a demand for new instruments of investment protection and stimulations that appeared only in the late decade of uh, the previous century, when the development of international trade and international investment was growing up. Plus, the window of opportunities has appeared for development the instruments of multilateral character of investment protection and stimulation further to a growing amount of bilateral investment treaties, double um, protection from double uh, taxation uh, treaties. And uh, the need in the multilateral instrument was to create the level playing field the minimum common denominator, minimum level of protection against the non-commercial risks in the countries involved. 
And since we are here in the European Union, uh, Europe was mostly dependent uh, since uh, the 70s, uh, uh, that was the growing dependence, from the suppliers from the outside of the European Union, from Norway, from Algeria, from Russia. And after the dissolution of the USSR, after dissolution of the former Comicon states, the new independent states has appeared between the sources of production in the East and the European Union, which means that a number of institutional risks has appeared because the legislation in these individual countries was developed uh, on the individual basis and each sovereign state has sovereign right to develop its legislation. And then the former Comic-Con countries became the members of the European Union. So all these developments, they create a number of these institutional risks related to transition in the former socialist countries, transition from the socialist way of development of the economy to the capitalist way of development of the economy. In the European Union countries, in moving from less liberal to more liberal world, in moving from the first gas and electricity directives uh, to the second and the third ones. So all this creates the prerequisites for creating the or trying to develop the level playing field between the countries involved in these cross-border energy value chains, since a lot of these energy value chains was related to the immobile fixed infrastructure. That does mean that the risk of investments related to this uh, fixed infrastructure was definitely higher compared to the risk of the investments regarding to some mobile mm, uh, assets. And the window of opportunities was the expectation of the European people after the fall of the Berlin Wall that now some positive changes will happen and uh, that will be a common denominator, the common thinking among this community. That's why after the Lubris Initiative in June 1990, on the 70th of December uh, 1991, uh, the political declarations European Energy Charter was signed by 50 uh, countries of Europe, uh, former USSR republics, um, United States and Canada, North America, because Europe at that time was understood in the transatlantic meaning of um, this term uh, in response or following the developments that were uh, initiated by the Helsinki Act of 1975. And then it took only three years to negotiate the legally binding instrument based on this political declaration. In political declara declaration, the countries were taking political obligation to follow the principles, the rules of non-discrimination, criminality, mutual uh, compatibility. Uh, in this uh, legal document, they would like to put this in the hard law terms to develop the enforceability instruments. And so the NGR Treaty has covered the investment protection area, trade, transit, uh, dispute settlements, uh, energy efficiency, and so on and so forth. So today, from my perspective, Energy Charter and its instrument presents the best effective, available, among others, multilateral instrument, energy-specific instrument of industry protection and stimulation in the area where the risks are the highest, non-commercial risks are the highest in energy industries compared to some manufacturing industries. For instance, you have these geological risks that is not available in other industries. A lot of infrastructure is immobile. Uh, if you have, for instance, the pipeline, it's not possible for you uh, to transport uh, the gas on oil on some other alternative routes because you will not, let me say, develop two or three uh, same pipelines to the same destination. Uh, but if you have, for instance, uh, road transportation, you can use different roads. So that's why the risks um, here are the highest. And from that point of view, uh, Energy uh, Charter Treaty is the unique instrument. And from my point of view, we can treat the development of this multilateral instrument within the broader context. That does mean that we need to consider the European Union today not uh, as only the unit consisting now of 28 member states, but we need to consider European Union as a part of the emerging Eurasian energy market. What does it mean? Today we are living, from my point of view, as I mentioned already, within the broader energy Europe, when it's not only European Union per se creating the part of this broader energy Europe, but also all the 
countries, all the sovereign states, uh, which are located through this uh, immobile energy infrastructure that uh, is destined for the European Union as a market, but is originated in non-European Union states, such as countries of North Africa, former CIS states. That does mean that border energy Europe today include these Northern African states, Russia, transit states of the CIS like Ukraine and uh, Belarusia, part of Asia because a lot of uh, oil and gas production is originated from Western Siberia, uh, Middle Asian states uh, as of today. Tomorrow, Middle East will also be a part of this broader energy Europe because when the, I'm saying not if, but when, the Iraqi gas will come to this network that will be bringing it to the European Union. When later on, after the sanctions will be lifted, Iraqi, uh, Iranian gas will be going there. When the Mediterranean pipeline ring will be developed and it will be developed, well, the broader energy Europe is expanding and will be expanding. But it is expanding as a part of uh, emerging Eurasian energy market. Because in Asia, all these pipeline systems are also being developed and through Russian territory, through Middle uh, Asia, the Asian part of Eurasia will be uh, connected with the European part. So we will be looking for much broader area with a big number of sovereign states that will develop a lot of capital intensive energy projects. And these energy projects need to face investment protection rules and means. How to do this? The way, from my point of view, the most effective one is to develop the common denominator, the common level playing field. And the charter is today is the best opportunity for taking this as a starting point for this. It's originated, it started in the 90s as the European undertaking. It was initiated by the European Union. The European Union was, in my terminology, the father and the mother of um, uh, this process. Definitely then it was supported uh, by a number of other countries. At some stages, some countries deviated from this process, for instance, United States and Canada, that were the signatories of the European Energy Charter, of the political declarations, in two weeks before signature signing ceremony of the Energy Charter Treaty, has deviated from this and they didn't uh, sign it. Some countries have been joining uh, this process later on, uh, like Pakistan. Uh, some countries are changing their mind in the process of accession, uh, in the process of um, uh, being the signatures of the treaty, like my country, Russia, who has uh, signed um, uh, the treaty, but then uh, and was applying in, uh, and has been applying in it from the very start until the autumn in 2009 uh, on the provisional basis. But unfortunately, from my point of view, it was a big mistake of my political leadership. They have decided to withdraw from provisional applications. I don't think that is the end. I think that in the future, well, I will not speak about the time frame, but Russia definitely will come back to this organization because it definitely has a lot of positive uh, values for the country, which is underestimated today. But definitely, uh, that is an evolving process. An evolving process that definitely is based on the principle that is the valuable principle of the international diplomacy, international economics, that it is a common denominator that create win-win opportunity, win-win situations for all the parties involved. That does mean that maybe individual endeavors of the individual countries are not satisfied in full, but it's the multilateral consensus that is established, that is created, that is fixed in this legal instrument. And that's its major value. So maybe it's not providing the maximum support, maximum benefits for each one individual country, but it's provide the biggest combined effect for the whole community. That's why it's important. It's a living organism, it's a living body within the emerging Eurasian energy market. It's an open institution, it's an open legal structure, it's, I will say, presented something like a Lego structure. That does mean it's model design structure, legal structure. So a new protocols, a new additional treaties can be added to it. It need not be considered as one uh, once signed um, document that is fixed, ex fixed in stone once and forever. It's the living organism that is being adapted, being developed further to the demands, further to the challenges, further to the risks which are coming from the evolution of the international energy markets. So it's just a respond, sometimes reactive, 
but hopefully in the future it will also a proactive response to the new challenges that are provided by the development of the international energy markets. Of course, it's important to mention what is the correlation between the NGRD Treaty and the European Union's energy key, because here we are sitting now in the um, European Union member states, in Estonia and Tartu. From my point of view, it needs to be clearly understood that European Union has a clear endeavor, clear intention, clear policy that is de facto policy. I don't think that is, let me say, uh, legally and um, officially presented policy, but it's de facto policy of expanding its energy IQ to all the neighboring countries through these cross-border energy value chains. And that's a natural intention to develop uh, further in geographical area the rules that are working rules inside the European Union. But other countries which are not European Union member states has their sovereign right either to agree to take these rules or disagree with them. Of course, the level of liberalization of the European Union energy markets is higher than this level of liberalization that is presented in the Energy Treaty. For instance, Energy Treaty does not demand vertically integrated companies to be unbundled, or for instance, Energy Treaty does not demand mandatory third-party access, which is really, since the second energy directives, is the case in the European Union. So from that point of view, each individual country which is a member state of the NGR Treaty, has the legal sovereign right to go further with the level of liberalization of its energy economy, which is clearly the case of the European Union member states. So energy IQ of the European Union definitely can go further with this level of liberalization than the energy charter level. But that doesn't mean that the European Union member states can demand that other members of the NGRT Treaty need to raise the level of liberalization of their energy economies to the level that is today is presented in the European Union. Moreover, there is definitely a political endeavor to export the key and those non-European Union countries that will be ready to take this political endeavor and implement this in their economy will do this. Those who will not like to do this have a right to stay with the lower level of standards of industrial protection that is provided by the NGR Treaty. And that's why when the NGR Treaty was developed, it was considered by the European Union member states as something like an instrument of export of energy IQ, because uh, the rules and provisions of the NGR Treaty fully corresponds to the first energy directives of the European Union that were developed at this very same time, in the early 90s. But when uh, developing the second directives that were uh, um, uh, adopted in uh, 2003. Since that time, we see the gap between the second gas directives and the NGR Treaty. And at that time, maybe the interest of the European Union to NGR Treaty as an instrument of uh, export of a key has been slowing down, and the new instrument was more favorable for European Union from this point of view, and that was Energy Community Treaty, which fully correspond to the second uh, energy directives, and that's put together the European Union and the countries of the South Eastern Europe. So, but that is the policy, and that is the mechanisms of exporting energy key by the European Union, where the countries of South Eastern Europe has agreed to adopt in their territories. But there is still a lot of space for the energy treaty within the emerging Eurasian energy market, because among 54, as of today, signatories to the Energy uh, Charter Treaty, 46 of them has ratified it. Uh, we still have, as you can understand, uh, mm, mm, around 24 countries which are not the members of the European Union. Uh, around 15 countries that are not the members of the European Union and the Energy Community Treaty. And there is I guess 23 now states, uh, mostly of Asia and the Middle East, who are observers to the energy charter process. Those who are on the move from being the observer to signing the political declaration to signing the energy charter treaty. So we see two parallel processes. Expansion, geographical expansion of the European Union and the energy charter treaty with different speeds that definitely leave the space for energy charter treaty per se outside the European Union, and we see the increasing space of investment protection uh, by the Energy Treaty, which is now covering not only energy material and products, 
as it was in its original version, but since 1998 it covers also the energy-related equipment. So today this multilateral set of legally binding rules provide the common denominator within the broadest possible group of countries. So I think the future for the energy treaty non-dependent whether my country, Russia, will decide to stay just as a signature and not to ratify it as was said in 2009, or whether it will change its mind, hopefully the sooner the better, and will come back to the issue of ratifying the energy charter treaty, re-evaluating the comparative values of risks and costs of this process. So non-dependent of Russia participation, I see the way forward for the energy treaty as the legal instrument and the energy process and the institutional fora for multilateral debate uh, in the international energy community, first of all in Eurasia, how to face the new challenges and risks that are related to the development of the energy market from less competitive to more and more competitive structures, and how to develop the new instruments of uh, legally, uh, legal protection against these risks within this multilateral institution that I will again repeat it as the final remark, which is today the best effective and the only one multilateral innocent protection treaty in the specific area, uh, in the energy area, which is facing the highest possible and commercial costs and risks compared to other industries. So I do believe in the future of the energy charter and I hope that it will provide you a good opportunities to deal with this issue in your research, in your future studies and in your future professional activities for those who would like to do this. Thank you very much for your attention and good luck.